Okay, welcome everybody. So as always, we thank the Gleshko Samuelson Foundation for the School of Social Sciences, Humanities, and Arts. Today it's a real pleasure to introduce Harold Altmansbacher. Um, he's coming all the way from Zurich, the Collegium, Collegium Helveticum in Zurich, which is quite an interesting uh, institute. Um, it actually bridges the uh, two universities uh, in, the, in the area and sort of creating interdisciplinary linkages that uh, brings to mind many features of this university. So um, he's done a lot of interesting work over the years. His background is in uh, physics, in algebraic quantum mechanics, in laser optics, in astrophysics, and then eventually he turned to issues in uh, philosophy of science and other interesting stuff on Jung, the Jung-Pauli connection. And these things uh, take him all over the place. He's been just now at Rice University and at the at SLN, at the Pacifica, uh, what is it, the Pacifica Graduate Center? Graduate the Pacific, Institute. Pacifica yeah. Graduate Institute. <coughs> and uh, of course, uh, saving the best for last here at UC Merced today before he goes back <laughs> by way of France, so we're all envious. Um, and today is a little break, so we've had this theme of citizen science and crowdsourcing and uh, digital media and so forth. Um, but today, uh, we had the opportunity to have Harold here, and so we're gonna sort of get to some sort of core theoretical issues in cognitive science uh, about the relationships between levels, for example, the relationship between neural dynamics and cognitive dynamics, which is of interest to a great many of us here. And of course, Harold's work has in inspired a lot of us. Um, and so we're delighted to have you. So please join me in welcoming uh, Harold Amansmacher. Thank you very much, um, Jeff, for this friendly um, introduction and also for the invitation to be here. I'm very happy to be here. It's a um, young university, and uh, you're still in the, in the state in which you can uh, shape the development of it. In the early stages, you have the highest potential to really shape something actively. Don't miss the opportunity. So, <laughs> I don't, I know you don't do that. <laughs> um, I want to talk about a project today that uh, we are following now for almost 15 years. So that started in, two, in the early 2000s, 2002, 2003. And um, so the t we now call it contextual emergence, but it went through uh, different other terms, which I don't want to tell you. <laughs> um, the project started actually as a kind of attempt to criticize a mainstream position in the philosophy of science that has been mainstream for, for many years, actually for decades. Uh, and the key word which is associated with that uh, mainstream position is called re is reduction. Right? In the philosophy of science in the 1950s and 60s, there were, there were several uh, very uh, influential people like Ernst Nagel, uh, Kemeny, and Oppenheim, and others, who actually wanted to push the idea that uh, science is successful only if phenomena that appear on, I don't know, whatever level can be reduced to something at a lower level, fundamentally to physics. So chemistry um, exists only as long as it is not really understood in terms of physics. That was one of, <laughs> one of the things which even my thesis advisor would tell me, you know, in the, back in the 1980s. So chemistry is not understood physics. And of course then this was also, uh, um, you know, um, in biology, molecular biology was on the rise. And that is also an attempt to just reduce biology and the richness of the biological world to some um, fundamental laws, maybe of physics or whatever. So that was the mainstream position. And uh, for a long time, uh, some people have argued against it, like one of my um, mentors, Hans Primas, was, one, was among them. And <coughs> so at, at some point, I thought it would really be good to start something, start a project, or maybe, maybe even a program uh, to set something against this position. And so what we started first with was an investigation of, of the, let's say, the paradigm examples that the 1960 philosophers of science always used to demonstrate that reduction works and test whether this is really the case. And this will be part of this talk today. One of the 
really number one examples uh, which ha have been used to show, show reduction is uh, the um, alleged reduction of temperature as a thermodynamical concept to the motion of molecules in statistical mechanics. And so we found out that, that even that example, which every, everybody bought in the middle of the last century, fails. It doesn't work that way. But you see this only if you look into the details, of course. And that's one of the uh, points which um, philosophers sometimes can be criticized about. They like to talk about things without really looking at the details. And when you don't look into the details, um, this may create misunderstandings. So that will be part of the talk today, um, and I will come back to this, of course. Now, the second story, the background story that I want to tell you um, is maybe useful for those of you who are uh, still in their graduate study, because that is about um, if you have an idea and, and write a paper, which difficulties can arise when you want to publish it? I mean, some of you have experienced this, of course, already. But in this case, it's particularly interesting because we try to argue against the kind of still more or less like mainstream position. And then, if you want to bring this idea into the philosophy of science community, which is split up into different schools anyway, then you always have at least one referee which finds the idea just horrible. It's just not this way, you know. So, Robert Bishop, who was the co-author, on this first paper, he was a, he at that time he was a philosopher of science, so he always asked me to try philosophy journals first, and I I would have gone for a physics journal, of course, in the first place. And he said, no, you know, for my career it's better to publish a philosophy paper. So we tried philosophy of science, we tried I don't know synthesis, we tried four or five, and you know for each version. Uh, we went into the revision phase, you know, and then it was returned and still not good enough. And it, so this was, this was a process that took years, two or three years, actually three years, three and a half years. And then at some point we decided, no, this is not the way to go. And then we sent it to Foundations of Physics. We had four referees. They were all in favor of publishing without changing, mm -hmm. without revisions. So you see, this is, this is another... This is, not, this is not science now, this is, this is sociology of science, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's still, I mean, you need, you need persistence and, um, how is that word, perseverance? Perseverance. Perseverance, yeah. perseverance or perseverance? <laughs> perseverance. How is it? Perseverance. Perseverance, right? Yeah, it's perseverance. <laughs> so you need both and, and you need to, you know, you need, you need conviction, about your own ideas, not give up too early. And so this is, this is the other background story that I wanted to uh, talk about before I start this. Now, um, I have a little program here, what I want to do. So I want to talk about interlevel relations in science uh, in, in, <coughs> in general, only very briefly as an introduction. Uh, then I want to talk about uh, the example that I mentioned already. The, the, relation between two different levels of description in physics, within physics, where people actually think that we have un understood everything pretty well. That is the relation between statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. And I will use this, it, it's, not, it's not a purpose for itself, right? I want to use this to, ex to show you how one can extract more general features of this relation which are hopefully general enough to be applicable to other relations, right? And then I will, <coughs> then I will apply uh, for the relation between these two different levels, the neural level and the mental level of neural mental states. For this, we will need some kind of technical background here. That will be, this will be the technical part of the um, talk. So um, don't be frustrated. It will only take maybe 10 minutes. And, and some of them I know, some of you are, I know are, are uh, mathemat mathematicians and computer scientists anyway, so you will have no problem. And then I go into some numerical tests and uh, empirical tests and uh, sketch out some future uh, ways to go. So. 
this is to just outline in a very cartoon-like way what interlevel inter relations can be about. And of course, the first caveat that I have to bring up here is this looks like a hierar linearly hierarchical uh, picture, and of course, in reality, this is not it's not linear and it's not hierarchical. It's just to it just serves the purpose of a, of a nice introduction. So here you have uh, levels of description. In the traditional picture, this would have been considered the lowest and most fundamental level to which everything should be reduced, right? And then you have um, when you go up, when you go up in this on this slide, then you see more and more refined descriptions, like from quantum systems to many particle systems. Uh, that would be that would be the statistical mechanics example. Then you have thermodynamics or hydrodynamics, solid state stuff. And then between here and here, there is a major jump because here you treat systems in thermal <coughs> equilibrium or very close to it. And here you make the step to non-equilibrium systems where, where the laws of thermodynamics in the classical sense do no longer apply. <coughs> and everything above here is, is far from equilibrium, essentially. Neurosystems, that's the brain, if you want. Mental systems, that's cognitive science or consciousness studies. Uh, philosophy of mind, then you can go up in body systems, behavior, and social systems. I don't know, but this is a but this is open-ended, of course. <coughs> so what you see here is, this is the two examples that I want to discuss in this presentation. This one is the first, between essentially between the relation between temperature and the mean kinetic energy of molecules. And this is the second example, which we will uh, see in the second half of the talk. Now here, <coughs> this goes back to what I said at the very beginning of this talk. Uh, here you see a kind of, um, again, schematic attempt of a categorization of different models that philosophers of science have developed to deal with interlevel relations, with relations between levels of description. So here you see, that you see a classification of four different, basically different options. And what you see here is the two columns on the right. Uh, you see what, what they say is uh, the, what they say is does the lower level L, the calligraphic L, low stands for lower level, contain necessary or sufficient conditions for the behavior of a system of a higher level calligraphic H? Right? And what you see, so when, when there is a yes here, this means that the lower level uh, provides necessary conditions for the higher level. When you say here, yes here, then, uh, then this means that the necessary conditions are also sufficient. And that's, of course, the situation that uh, people like um, uh, Kimini and Oppenheimer and Ernst Nagel and others, that's the position that they held. So you, when you reduce, in a strong sense, uh, the, the, higher, the higher levels, uh, the, 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 the behavior of a system at a higher level of description to the behavior at the lower level. And you can do that just by deriving everything from below. Now the, the straight opposite would be the lower line here, which is often called radical emergence. Radical emergence. And in radical emergence you would have neither necessary nor sufficient conditions. It is no and no. Um, neither necessary nor sufficient conditions for higher level behavior from lower level behavior. And that's of course something that, I mean, if you're talking about interlevel relations, and essentially there are none, this is not, not very interesting. Though it has been discussed also in the philosophy of science, that's a kind of patchwork picture which people like Nancy Cartwright, for instance, have uh, made propaganda for. This is the all power fire album to some extent. That's the anything goes politics. So here you have a very rigid system of all sciences which are reducible to the lowest. And here you have a very flexible, overly flexible system in which anything goes. And, and as it turns out, both are not satisfactory for what really happens. So that makes the two 
you know, intermediate positions interesting. And uh, these positions are supervenience and contextual emergence. Supervenience, you may have heard, essentially um, um, propagated by the work of Jack Wan Kim at Brown University. And in supervenience, you have sufficient conditions for higher level behavior on the lower level, but no necessary conditions. And in contextual emergence, it's just the other way around. So I will operate with these two intermediate positions in this talk because uh, I think by now everybody um, talks about more or less these different possibilities and radical emergence and strong reduction are not really right now, I mean I'm talking 2016, right? mm -hmm. um, are not really considered with that much emphasis anymore. <coughs> Are you still with me? So I'm coming to the first example. That's the example of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics. So I have to go through this view graph here now. Um, at this, on this view graph, I want to discuss the supervenience issue. And when you look at this, uh, at this line, at these lines here, you see the lower level characterized here the higher level characterized here, and the arrow in this implication goes from left to right. So that's a logical implication which expresses suf sufficient but not necessary conditions. Right? So whenever you know this, then you can, then this implies that. But when you have this, this doesn't imply that. Why? Because one temperature state can be multiply realized by mechanical states. So when you have one of those multiple realizations, you know it's this temperature state by implication. But if you have this state, you don't know which one of those applies. So that, that's why the, the arrow goes that, doesn't go that way. So this expresses the sufficiency of a condition here. A thermodynamic system at the higher level, that would be the higher level in this example, can be multiply realized by many particle system, many molecules in a container of gas, let's say, as long as the statistical distribution of these, of, of particular particle properties at the lower level satisfy particular conditions. And, and uh, these particular conditions are formalized by a certain kind of distribution, for instance, of the velocities. It's called the Maxwell distribution. Now, when this is the case, then you have at the lower level many configurations of particles with different uh, positions and different speeds, different momenta. But you can associate with all these configurations one distribution for the ensemble as a whole, statistical state of the ensemble as a whole. And then you can calculate the mean kinetic energy simply from the, from the momenta. The mean kinetic energy is important because we know, know heuristically that the mean kinetic energy builds the bridge to the higher level of description. We, I'm emphasizing heuristically we know this, um, and this will be part of the next slide. Uh, nobody for more than 100 years came up with a kind of sound argument that this heuristic connection between the mean kinetic energy and the temperature of a system, how this can be formalized and understood in detail, again, understood in detail. So uh, now the question is why, I'm just rephrasing what I said in that sentence, why are there these correlations between statistical states with a mean kinetic energy of a certain kind and temperature states with a certain temperature? Where do these you know, correlations come from? And this brings us into the picture of contextual emergence. Now we are talking about an implication error which goes the other way. Now we're talking about necessary but not sufficient conditions at the lower level. So what we have here is canonical observables, equations of motion, and all the nice features that mechanics gives us. And we want to study 
why the correlation to the temperature state exists. And here is how we do it. And this is essentially now, I mentioned that to just draw your attention to the next few lines. Uh, this is the, let's say, the schematic heart or core of how contextual emergence functions. So the first thing that we have to do is, for contextual emergence, we have to select a context that is related to the upper level of description, to the higher level of description. And the context in the thermodynamic case is actually very simple to guess because the temperature, when you want to define it, what you need is, the first thing you need is thermal equilibrium. When you have systems out of thermal equilibrium, temperature is not defined. That's also expressed by what people know, that, uh, know as the zeroth law of thermodynamics. I don't know why it's the zeroth law, it's just a thing. So you select the context, this context is important for the notion of contextual emergence. That's this context which goes into the, into, the, into the term, right? Now, next step is, um, once you have the context at the higher level, you find a way to implement that context somehow at the lower level. And the way we do it, we do it, is always by a stability condition. And for all the examples that we have studied so far, we can find this kind of implementation. So you stabi the stability condition uh, that we can implement, that the stability condition that we can find to implement the context of thermal equilibrium at the lower level is called the KMS condition. That's something I don't want to explain that. That comes out of quantum field theory. This would lead us too far away from our topic. But that is the interesting thing historically is that the KMS condition, Kubo, Martin, and Schwinger, three names, three physicists. Uh, the KMS condition was found not before the late 1960s. The heuristic relation between kinetic energy and temperature was at that time 110 years old. So just to give you an idea how long it can take, even within physics, how long it can take uh, before a heuristic idea that turns out to be correct can be fleshed out really in detail as a, as a, as a, um, as a sound argument, let me say. So the correlations between the thermal state and the statistical mechanics state, why do they exist? This question is answered by the KMS states, which implement a context, the context of thermal equilibrium at the mechanical level of description. Why this works in detail, I can't tell you, but um, that, that you have to believe. Now, <coughs> now we are at the lower level of description and have these uh, KMS states, which are which are states that are stable with respect to fluctuations or perturbations. That's what the notion of stability means. And this property of stability now gives us a new, we say, topology. So it introduces a kind of coarse graining or a kind of partition on the lower level state space. And, and the part, or yeah, I, I should say a partition. And what is the partition? A partition is, in this case, uh, a kind of introduction of equivalence classes of states. Equivalence classes of states means that all states that are in this equivalence class are equivalent with respect to the temperature state that we want to use them to define. So whether, uh, whether in this statistical distribution of moving uh, molecules in the container of gas, whether, whether Molecule A is here, or is here, or molecule B have this, has this speed, or that speed, is irrelevant for the temperature. That's what it means. So that's what the notion of topology actually uh, implies, or entails, I should say. So we have this coarse graining. And then we can assign equivalence classes of these lower level states to single, to single individual higher level states with the same temperature. So a statistical distribution lower level states is then simply identified with a temperature state for all these different molecules with that behavior that fits the statistical distribution. 
So we start with temperature, that, that with the quantity that we want to, this, want to understand. We find a context, thermal equilibrium. We implement it on the lower level as a stability criterion. Then on the lower level, the stability criterion gives us equivalence classes of states. And those can be used to define the temperature state. So we have a very nice self-consistent picture between these two levels of description. It's self-consistent. OK, here are the, the important papers for the definition of KMS states and uh, in which this whole um, procedure is described in detail in algebraic language. You will not, when you read these papers, you will not find the notion of mechanics. You will not find the notion of thermodynamics. It's highly abstract. Uh, so you, um, it needs people who know algebraic quantum mechanics to understand this. But this is the, you know, the, what I just tried to demonstrate to you with my hands. This is the general procedure uh, in which contextual emergence works. And now we are going uh, to try and understand how it can be applied to the relation between neural states and metal states. Are you still with me? <laughs> Good. So, and the next two slides will be, you know, they're, they're structured exactly the same way as the example with the statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, so you have an easy time to make references back to the story that I just told you. <coughs> So this starts with a kind of definition that Dave Chalmers gave a few years ago, 2000. He was interested about, many people are, are now interested in neural correlates of conscious states. And he gave this definition. A neural correlate of consciousness can be multiply realized by mi his terminology, minimally sufficient neural subsystems correlated with states of consciousness. So, what do you see here? You see the notion of multiple realization again. We had that before. You see the notion of a lower level of description, the neural subsystems. And you have the notion of um, a higher level description, states of consciousness or meta states. So it's already very much in parallel with what we talked about in the <coughs> preceding example. Now again arrow points to the right, so we talk about supervenience here. Many configurations of neurons with particular properties at the lower level of description, many configurations are multiple realizations of one and the same mental state. So this would be the temperature. I'm, I'm not saying that the mind is like temperature, you know, and, except you are in fever. But I'm not saying that, but I, I only want to point out the structural analogy between the, between the different procedures how to construct higher level states. That's the point I want to make. But now, again, the question is, why do we have this correlation? And at this point, I should actually put something into brackets, because, you know, when you talk to, typically talk to, to brain science people, they don't understand this question. Why? because they think that the, the, the neural correlate actually is an explanation of a mental state. So they don't ask for an explanation of the correlation because they think this is already the explanation. I, I don't know whether I can make myself understandable. You know, when you are, when you are uh, working in a completely physicalist framework, you, you would say, of course, there are maybe some mental states that people talk about, but actually our program is to reduce them to the physical, or to the brain in that case. And once we found the brain structures that are correlated with the mental state, then these brain structures explain the mental state. That's not, what, that's not the way I'm going here. I'm going the way that we have, we find neural correlates, that's the brain states, and what we now really want to understand is the co why do we have the correlation between those and those? This is a non-physicalist framework, of course. Just bracket close. Now again, the parallel to the other slide. Uh, now we come to contextual emergence. 
So we have the implication arrow the other way around. And now let me apply the same step-by-step -step procedure to um, make a proposal, in this case, how contextual emergence can be applied to the relation between the neural as the lower level and the mental as a higher level. First of all, select the context. And uh, now this is, of course, much more difficult than in physics. In physics, we have a very uh, almost, I should say, closed system of theoretical frameworks which are known to be consistent and we know a lot about them. Here we are in more or less unexplored territory. So we really have to go much more with good intuition and guided guesses and something like that. So one possibility to select the context would be what Chalmers has called phenomenal, phenomenal families. But, uh, and I don't want to go into details here, uh, I think a much more interesting um, way to find a good context uh, is given or can be, can be demonstrated if you start with an, experiment, with an experiment, with an experimental situation which you want to analyze in this way. Because in an experiment, you always preset the context. For instance, if you um, have an experiment in which you try to find neural correlates of, let's say, different perceptual states, let's say vision, auditory, gustatory, or whatever, then this is your context, because that, that's where you get the data from. So when you have an experiment, this is, I think, in, in a, a relative early stage of study like, like this, uh, I would say um, a good choice of context is always already prescribed by the experiment that you will And I will attempt. You will see that in more detail when I discuss this more precisely. So the next step is you want to implement this context at the lower level of description, that would be the neural level of description. And now, you don't see KMS here anymore. You see something else. It's SRB. <laughs> you know what that is? SRB is the equivalent of a KMS state out of equilibrium. That's why I mentioned this, the, the important difference between equilibrium states and out of equilibrium. Here we are talking about living matter, right? The brain. The brain doesn't, the, the brain is not in thermal equilibrium except you're dead. Right? So SRB stands, now you will, some of you will know, will recognize the names. The first one is Sinai, Jakob Sinai, now in Princeton. Um, David, David Ruel in Paris. And the, the B stands for Rufus Bone. So what are these people known for? They are known for major progress in dynamical systems theory. Scott knows them. I haven't met them. No. You have met them, you know them. So they have coined the notion of an SRB state, and that's essentially a statistical state, again, which describes an attractor, or the, I should say, the, the probability distribution over, over a kind of subset of your state space, which can be called an attractor. Right? That's the SRB states. So again, we have a statistical state here. And what does it do? It generates a cross grain. Same way like the KMS states, but now, of course, out of equilibrium. So the cross graining, and I will come to that. Um, this is really an important point, which I will discuss in more detail. The cross graining is not arbitrary. It, it is, you have, you, there are criteria to find a good coarse graining, or we call it a proper coarse graining versus an improper coarse graining. And that's related, related, related to a notion that is actually due to Sinai, Ruel, and Bowen. The, the notion is called a generating partition. Just so you have heard it when it comes back in three minutes. Right, the generating partition, important concept. Now once we have that, we can use the equivalence classes of lower level states, which are given by that coarse graining, and can identify single higher level states with the same phenomenal properties by these equivalence <coughs> classes of lower level states, by the statistical distribution with which, in, which, which is statistical, which is given by the statistical SRB state. So that's, so far this is a proposal, right? Because we are on unexplored. 
territory. And now I want to show you in the, um, in the rest of this talk, yeah, some more minutes I have, right? Um, I, wa I first want to make this kind of little excursion into some um, formal mathematical background because you need to understand a little better what generating partitions are. And then I will show you some examples really of um, relations between neural states and metal states that can be worked out with this kind of proposal. And you will see that it works wonderfully. I hope you will agree. Okay, so that's the rest of the program. <coughs> by the way, this whole procedure has been worked out by in a collaboration with Peter Van Graven, who some of you know, it was published in 2007. So this is a little bit of a very basic stuff in uh, dynamical systems theory. I assume that many of you have seen something like that before. Maybe not exactly this, but something like it. So you, what you see here is uh, the red line. This is the trajectory of the system <coughs> in its phase space. So this is the two-dimensional phase space simply. It's, of course, a, a simplification or an idealization. That these tra trajectories can be mapped onto strings of a finite set of sim symbols by partitioning the phase space into disjoint cells. So disjoint means they should not overlap, but in, in their totality they should cover the complete phase space. That means disjoint. Now the phase space uh, is considered the lower level description and the symbols are the higher level description at the end, or lead us to the higher level description. Symbols are A1, this is that cell, A2 is this cell, A3 is this cell, A4 and so on. Now what you do is essentially you map successive points on the trajectory like x0, x1, x2, x3 onto the cells of the phase space in which they are located. It's a very simple procedure action. So x0 and x1 are both in A1. X2, 3, 4 are in A4. X5 is in A3. So if you map this trajectory into a symbol sequence, that would read A1, A1, A4, 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 A3. Okay? So then you can have a very simple description of the dynamics. You don't need something like differential equations anymore. Just have a symbol sequence. And you can study the grammar of that sequence. And the grammar of that sequence is if everything goes well, and I will tell you what everything means, if everything goes well, the grammar of the sequence is a faithful representation of the nonlinear dynamics of the system in its phase space. That's fantastic, because then you have a very simple description for something which in the beginning was mathematically quite complicated. And nevertheless, everything that is important for the higher level of, this, of the description of the system is retained if everything goes well, and everything goes only well if, these parti if this partition, if the cells are, are derived in a proper way. And that's what I want to show you next. Um, I think I jump over this. That has to do with the notion of generating partitions. No, I cannot jump over this. I have to show you this too. There are two different possible, I mean there are more, but two, two different ways to, to generate or to, to come up with a partition for different uh, situations in, in symbolic dynamics and dynamics of these symbolic systems. One of these <coughs> situations is what we, what we call a cyclic shift and that's everything that is somehow reducible in a mathematical sense. So we have fixed points or uh, limit cycles or something like that would belong to this class. And then we have irreducible shifts. And the irreducible shifts are the symbolic dynamics expression for chaotic attractors or chaotic systems. So here, for, for a very simple uh, system with cyclic shifts, we have four, multiply, four, four um, <coughs> multiple, no, I should say four coexisting uh, fixed points you see here, and they, they have basins of attraction like this, and these basins of attraction are a good partition for the system. That's very plausible. 
can, can also be shown, of course. The irreducible shift is different because here you have a, contract, a periodic attractor and it's, it's completely uh, untransparent or unillustrative uh, to begin with what a good partition on such an attractor is. And this is where the notion of a generating partition comes in. Right? How do I partition an, a periodic attractor in such a way that it becomes proper? So uh, this is the little little um, form, little bit of a formal slide. Here I need to, in order to describe this to you, just as a little background information, which which you might want to have. Uh, what you need is the notion of a dynamical entropy of the system. You all know what the entropy is without the dynamical stuff. Entropy of a partition over a phase space that is just up here. This, these are the cells, A1, A2, up to AM. Uh, is simply given by this equation here, which is known since 1949, Shannon's work. Okay. So the entropy of the partition is the sum of the probabilities, or here it's the mu's, it's the measures, of the cells times the logarithm of that, of those measures of the cells. But now we are talking about dynamics. So it's not enough to look at the partition itself. We also have to look at the way in which this partition or its boundaries are you know, transformed under the action of the dynamics, under the action of the flow, or as mathematicians say, under the action of the automorphism. This is, means essentially the dynamics. So we can go from this static partition to a static entropy to a uh, uh, to a dynamic entropy by involving the evolution of the partition over time. And that's what, what's written in here. This is essentially what's, what, is, what's, what stands here is something like this entropy, but it's unfolded over different time steps of your dynamical flow. So you have the product partition of the partition originally with the partition which, onto which the dynamical flow is applied once uh, up to n minus 1 times. So this gives you a, a, a kind of increasing refinement of your partition. And the dynamical entropy is calculated by the product partition of all the partitions with increasing refinement. That sounds a little bit complicated. But the, the essential point here is that you get, you, get a part, you, get a, you get an entropy which is not only dependent on, on the structure of your phase space and the partition itself, but you also uh, you, you introduce something which reflects the dynamical evolution of the system. Now, once you have this dynamical entropy, you can of course study it with different partitions, with different flows and so on. And what you find is, that there is one particular dynamical entropy which is distinguished exactly if the, if the partition that you have chosen is the so-called generating partition. And this entropy, which refers to the generating partition, is called the Kolmogorov and Senai entropy. And it, it maximizes all dynamical entropies that you can have for the system with different partitions. So if you, would, if you would just apply a variation of principle over all possible partitions, which is very hard to do, I have to tell you, because you, they are counted in many, of course, uh, then you would get the komogorov sinai entropy when you have that partition, which is generated. The maximum of all possible dynamical entropies for the system. Now, I think this can intuitively be understood in the following way, and then I will stop with this. Can be intuitively understood by the follow in the following way. When you have, I mean, an entropy always has to do with correlations. So entropy is high when the cor correlations are low. When you have a lot of correlations, you get a low entropy. Now, when you have the wrong partition, not the generating partition, then what happens is that the role of blurred cells of the partition boundaries due to the dynamics, step one, step two, step three, they get more and more blurred, creates correlations 
uh, in excess of that kind of entropy that comes from the dynamics alone. So the, the more blurring you have introduced by, mis by improper partitions, the, the more correlations you introduce, which, which in turn means the lower is the entropy that you get from the calculation of the dynamic entropy. So um, the, the best partition that you can get is the one where boundaries of cells are mapped onto boundaries of cells under the, under the dynamics. Because then you can make sure that the only entropy that you're left with is due to the true dynamics. No, there are no spurious contributions due to blurring. I think that's a very nice way to understand this whole thing in a, in a kind of plausible way. So generally, partitions are the ones we are looking for. Uh, and um, for chaotic attractors, we know how we can construct them. Uh, they provide a rigorous theoretical constraint for well-defined mental states independent of their empirical plausibility. And this I jump over because that would lead us into another topic. Now what I really want to do now at the end is uh, show you how the whole methodology works. First of all, we, I, I go through some um, numerical tests that we did. And the numerical tests that we did work with, uh, with, coexist, with multiple coexisting fixed point attractors. So we simulate four coexisting fixed point attractors with noise. So the noise helps us to uh, make sure that there is a dynamics between the, the, between the different basins of attraction. Can put, the noise can push the system from one basin into the other one. Then we um, choose a, tr a kind of auxiliary uh, grid, which is not the final partition that we are looking for. It's a finer grade partition, like 100, times 100 by 100 grid. Determine the transition matrix of the system on this auxiliary grid. So the transition matrix would be a 100 by 100 matrix. And each entry in the matrix describes how often the system goes from the grid in the, in the, on the vertical scale into the grid on the horizontal scale. Then we uh, do a spectral analysis of this, calculate eigenvalues and corresponding time scales. Because the eigenvalues in the, in the, in the tradition, in, the tra in, the, in a transition matrix are always time scales, related time scales. Then we can look for gaps in the uh, spectrum of time scales. I, sh I show you that in more detail the next uh, new graph. And then we can use the corresponding eigenvectors for identifying the partition. And that works fantastically, like you can see here. So this is the spectrum of eigenvalues of the transition matrix. You see this, it always starts with one. And then the eigenvalues are ordered by their size. So they go down more and more. Uh, then this can be transformed into time scales. You see, it, again, they go down and they more and more. But what you see here is already you have certain jumps, and then you have values which are more or less the same. Then you have jumps again, you have more values than ones. So you have gaps in the eigenvalue spectrum. And here you can, this is, this is a measure which is designed to emphasize these gaps. It's a time scale separation factor, you see. We have one time scale separation factor which is high at two, and one which is high at four. So this means, I, I'm telling you that, you can't see it directly from the picture. This means that you have, a part, you have two possible partitions for your system. And the system has four coexisting fixed points that I told you already. So you have one meaningful partition with four fixed points, but you have another one, that, that's what the analysis tells us, with two fixed points, with, with two, one part, another partition which only has two cells superimposed on the whole landscape of four fixed points. I will, I will tell you what, that's, what that means later. First of all, now go, let's go to this. This is the, here we have the eigenvalues. Whenever you have an eigenvalue, you have a corresponding eigenvector. And here you have the first, no, I mean the first eigenvector is always trivial, it's the, it's the identity. So here, here we have the first non-trivial, three non-trivial eigenvectors, and now we represent all the states, all the points which the system generates 
in this in this um, four coexisting uh, attractor you know picture, we can put them all into into this kind of eigenvector representation, and what we see, we find a simplex, and that's generic. We find a, four, a simplex with four vertices, and now what we do is we can, I mean, we do, we do it with colors, we can use every vertex of a simplex, of this simplex, to identify whether each point, which is here, this is a result of the simulation, whether each point, to which vertex each point is closest. So all those green points are closest to this one, all the blue ones are closest to this vertex, all the red ones are closest to this, all I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the yellow ones, and all the red ones are close to this. Now we go back to the original state space and plot all the points which come out of the numerical simulation, all the green points, we go back into the original state space and plot the green again. All the blue points in the original state space plot the blue again. All the yellow ones become yellow, all the red ones become yellow. So what, what do we get? A partition into four cells. Right? I mean, of course, in this case, we, we would know this beforehand because we have constructed the system this way. But, um, of course, you do these tests in order to test whether the methodology gives you the right result. Now, the next example is the empirical example. Uh, that's, that's one where we don't know what comes out really. But this is a very reassuring thing, and you see here that the <coughs> this would be the representation with four different cells, which relates to the to the time scale separation factor, which is high at four. But you see also that you can do a bipartition here, like this, which which has one cell over here and the other cell over, over there. That would be the time scale separation factor that is high at two. And why is this also a reasonable partition? Because when you simulated the system, we put the noise high in the vertical direction and low in the horizontal direction. So there are much more transitions vertically between these basins of attraction than here. So we have another reasonable partition. We have one reasonable partition that is into four states, four basins of attraction. We also have a reasonable partition into, into two. So depending on the context that we choose, we can, we can say we are interested more in this partition or we are interested more in this, in the four partition. So by this, by this scale, we can introduce some, something like scales according to which different levels of description of the system can be characterized. Okay, now the last part of the talk is uh, empirical data. And that is data from, that's about EEG data from, uh, time, EEG time series from petit mal subjects, right? What we do here is first of all we um, compactify the very high dimensional state space, 20 dimensions, it's a little hard to study, to three principal components, then we have a kind of nice low dimensional state space. Again, we do this auxiliary grid. Uh, and calculate the transition matrix for it. We do the eigenvalues, calculate the corresponding time scales, we look for gaps, uh, and uh, the gaps give us the number of relevant eigenvectors. Then we can take these relevant eigenvectors to construct the proper phase space partition, and then we can, in this case, since we have these empirical data, we can go back to the original time series and locate the position of all the states um, as belonging to higher level states, mental states, in correspondence to the, to the lower level neural states. And then we can see whether this fits. So we, we, we still have a kind of test, but it's not a test that is that relies on that we know what we did in the beginning, because the petty mass objects did it. We didn't do it. It's not a simulation, it's a fair data really. So what we find here is the following. Again, these are the eigen, eigenvalues or the, the time scales, which is essentially the same. 
And here we get a high, um, I don't, this, this slide doesn't contain the time separation, time square separation factor separately, so I just put it in here. The high, the, the high time scale separation factor is 4, 3, so a tripartition. And so what, it, what this means is we go into this eigenvector space. Again, we find a simplex. But now it doesn't have, it doesn't have four vertices. It only has three, of course, because we're looking for eigenvalue three. Right? So this is three. This is three vertices, so we have the, um, those points from the data series, from the time series, which are closest to this vertex. These are the green ones. Those are closest to this vertex are the red ones. And those which are closest to this one are the blue ones. And now we can go back into the principal components. What we see is, so this is a three-dimensional state space, which is the compactification of the 20-dimensional uh, state space that we recorded. Right? So we see a kind of structure here, which has many states in the middle, the blue ones. Here are the green ones, here are the red ones. This is the partition into three different mental states, arising from a completely irregular um, EEG time series at the level of the neural states. And now I go back to the original representation simply of the time series. So now the next slide shows you simply, you know, these are four different electrodes. And you see this kind of irregular behavior. You see also that there are periods in which the amplitudes go high. That's known for epileptic seizure states. And here in the upper, uh, in the upper panel A, you see, I should go, I should go back to the before. You see the blue, red, and green in the time series. So wherever you see blue, this should be the normal state. Whenever you see green, that should be part of the epileptic seizure state. And whenever you see red, this should be another part of the epileptic seizure state. You can argue that when you put blue into light blue here and green and red into this red, you will see that exactly those episodes, which are the epileptic seizure episodes, are covered by this kind of mental state. Symbolic state. It's a symbolic state. So and this is a result uh, which we had hoped for, but we hadn't really expected that it comes out so clearly. This is, I mean, this is a very clear uh, indication that this methodology in this case really works. We are just working with, with Carsten Allefeld, who is now at the Mind Brain Institute in Berlin. We are working on uh, further examples like this, and um, I'm quite optimistic that we can do much more with this methodology. So it's a spectral analysis essentially of the time series that you have at the neural level. And in a, you know, superficially it looks like a complicated procedure, but once, once you have it, implemented on a computer, you could just run it, right? fix a few parameters, and then you can kind of come up with a very nice classification. Um, I should mention the following. I mean, I said already, this is a high time scale separation factor. But when you look at the further decay of the eigenvalues, you see another a, a place where you could say there is a little thing like a gap like here, at um, four, five, six, seven, between seven and eight, or eight and nine, something like that. This would suggest, in parallel to the example that I showed you, the simulated example that I showed you before, that there is another scale in the system where you can make further distinctions. And uh, we, we tested this to a certain extent, and we found that all these additional cells of a partition which would be introduced if you also consider, uh, say, I value four, five, six, and seven, they all pertain to the blue level here. So what they actually do is they indicate a refinement of the normal mental state, the blue state, which we don't know what it, is, what it is about because it's not part of the experiment. We don't know it. But it's very plausible that a per person in a normal mental state that is 
normal only in opposition to epileptic seizure state, that that person has different kinds of states in that mental state, in that normal mental state. So it's very plausible. But we don't know what it is. OK, that's more or less, I think, in the end. Related work that we did, just to give you a little bit of an overview that this was not the end of the story. Um, we can, of course, with the same um, procedure also characterize neural mac macrostates from neural microstates. So we can go into the deep structure of brain states. Um, EEG states are, of course, neural macrostates at the neural level. You can go down to local field potentials or maybe even spike trains or something like that. And then you can apply the same procedure. That works. We, um, together with Jens Habecke, a philosopher in uh, some other place in Germany, we could present some very interesting, I think for philosophers this is interesting, kind of, I, call it, I like to call it a deflationary approach to mental causation, a long-standing uh, discussion in the philosophy of mind. Uh, do mental states have a power to change future mental states, or is this all going on at the neural level? Jack Wan Kim, who I mentioned before, he has, he has uh, launched many arguments that actually this happens at the, at the physical, at the, at the brain level. But uh, this is not, I mean, we are arguing this is not the only way you can go. Then Peter Van Graben has published a little bit about intentionality as an emergent property. This is also philosophy of mind stuff. Um, another interesting line of research is, you know, in the biomedical sciences, people are often talking about translational research now, when they uh, say that, um, for instance, in drug development, you start with a kind of, um, let's say, molecular biology arrangement, and try to find out which combinations of molecules might be good receptor blockers or whatever it is. Then you go to the um, preclinical phase where animal experiments are done, and then you go to the clinical phase of the whole story. And so you have to translate the knowledge that you have, that you, that you, um, that you get at these different levels to the next level or, or always. And of course, um, what happens is that from level to level, certain distinctions <coughs> may become irrelevant. And this is, uh, there's also a paper about this, which we published a few years ago. That's the, in the spirit of these equivalence classes and so on. And a final point which I wanted to make is uh, something that we have been discussing this morning, right? Um, originally, originally, to be on the safe side. Uh, when I was asked, are you talking about levels of nature? Or are you talking about levels of description, of our description of nature? I would always have said, no, well, we're talking about the, about the descriptive, first of all. But of course, it would be interesting um, if this has something to do with nature itself. So is nature hierarchical? Is it organized in terms of layers and all these kind of, these kinds of questions? And we have, uh, we have come up with a, with a, with a Actually, not we have come up with that idea. Quine has come up with a very interesting idea that addresses this issue. Um, Quine called it ontological relativity. And what he says is essentially um, the notion of an ontology should not be used to refer to some fundamental ontology to which everything can be reduced. Quine said that, believe it or not. I mean, the egghead of analytical philosophy. And, but but his, his proposal was um, every level of description should be entitled <laughs> to define an ontology with respect to the context, that's my word, from which you look at the problem that you're just describing. So you have to make an ontological commitment to a certain level. And then um, you have to stay consistent with that, with that kind of commitment. And when you make another commitment, of course, that's your choice, but then you have to they consistent within that. So what is epistemic and what is ontic is not universally given. There is some kind of relativity. So it's a new kind of relativity beyond uh, the relativity that we know already in physics. And it's not an, an anything goes relativity. And it's, of course, a rejection against 
a fundamental and very rigid ontology to, it, to which everything can be reduced. So, that was it. Thank you very much for your attention.